Welcome, football fans, to another edition of IDP Plus Bets. I am your host, the D-Gen Doc, a.k.a. Sebastian Fearon. How are we doing, folks? I am back coming at you live for another UFL, United Football League, breakdown and best bets edition. Coming from you live from another hotel in another state. Hey, listen, uh, apologies about last week. Had some obligations there through the Army. We are we were in the field, so ain't no internet out there. So, uh, yeah, that's why there was no no picks last week, uh, but we're back. We are back for week nine of the United Football League. Looks, folks, we got two weeks of the regular season left. Then we got two games in the playoffs as far as for that first round. You got your XFL and USFL Conference Championship, and then you got the granddaddy of them all, the UFL, the first ever UFL Championship there it's going to be in st louis too so we'll see if the bada hawks make it if we get the birmingham st louis kind of big matchup again in st louis that battle dome will be incredible but mm, i don't know i don't know i'm not sure st louis is going to get there so we're going to talk about all that and break down everything everything in week nine we're going to give you all the different angles i'm going to give out my best bets as far as what we what i think is really absolutely the plays i love this week and there are some but first we've got a recap let's go ahead and recap the week eight here so let's look at those week eight scores oh where did that go give me one second there Uh uh-oh coming back and already having some technical difficulties there she is all right let's pull up your week eight scores from last week okay so uh what's michigan panthers another win even though they're doing that court two quarterback system with bryce perkins and uh brian lewerke <laughs> so they're on qb3 and four right now memphis showboats continue to lose same thing with the rough next rinse and repeat both games had big spreads both games definitely had potentials for blowouts but i believe both the dogs and really poor teams covered in those uh because the spreads were so large even though they lost by a, a touchdown there and then uh big really the big game was the dc st louis dc was fighting for the playoff lives st louis was hope, looking to clinch playoffs um and they did just that by defeating dc at home without aj mccarron with backup quarterback manny wilkins and then san antonio uh solidified their chance at still having a shot for a number one seed uh by getting the victory over arlington there so really you know the good teams won and the bad teams lost but obviously when it comes to gambling it's about who covered that spread there uh so you know you definitely had a couple dogs cover there uh and then a couple of the favorites on sunday so let's go ahead and look at this next slate here first off your playoffs are set right so we now know for certain what we all thought but the Michigan Panthers will pay the Birmingham Stallions in the USFL Conference Championship on Saturday, June 8th. So a couple weeks from now. And then that Sunday will be the XFL Championship between San Antonio and St. Louis. So we know the four teams out of the eight that are in the playoffs. What we don't know is who's going to be the number one seed, who gets home field advantage for those games. And that is where our playoff scenarios come into play here let's go ahead and bring uh here's the graphic let's see so here's your little cleansing scenarios basically uh birmingham if they win or michigan loses they will clinch the one seed um over in the conference obviously birmingham would have to lose twice and michigan would have to win out for them for that to be obviously a chance uh, so really, Birmingham just has to win one of these last two weeks, and they're they will have that number one seed. Uh, and then in the XFL, it's a lot more open. So San Antonio, if they win out, they get the one seed. Now, all but all St. Louis has to do is uh, they'll have to win and lose. So it's a bit of a <laughs> the way they wrote this is a bit confusing. But essentially, Birmingham just one win last two weeks. They will clinch. Uh, St. Louis, if they win out they'll clinch if san antonio uh wins oh i see so san antonio has to win out if they win to this week and next week they'll get it if st louis wins this week and san antonio loses they'll get it so a little bit more up to grabs there in the xfl i would be hard pressed to imagine that the birmingham Stallions don't pick up a win in one of these last two weeks but 
it's an interesting situation because if we look at our slate here for the week, for this weekend, week nine, you see, you know, you got St. Louis heading up to Arlington. Uh, again, they need to win and they want Birmingham or San Antonio to lose. But you have the Stallions versus the Brahmas. I think that's the big game this week that you really want to highlight a potential UFL championship game. If San Antonio can, you know, say they win this week, next week, they get home field and they get San Antonio or St. Louis to come to town and they, they, the Brahmas take out the Battle Hawks. I think that's definitely possible. They already beat them earlier in the year. Uh, or no, actually, I'm sorry. St. Louis did win that game, but it was a very close game that came down to the wire there. So it was already kind of a toss up 50, 50 game. So, uh, man, I, I'm ex really excited for this. I'm a little bit higher on San Antonio than, you know, I, I, I'm not ready to just write in St. Louis and Birmingham in the championship. Well, I'm, I'm pretty close to being able to write in Birmingham, but, but not St. Louis just yet, especially with the injury to McCarron, uh, AJ McCarron looming large there. And then for Sunday, you've got Michigan taking on Houston and you've got DC uh, taking on the showboats again, Michigan, you know, assuming if Birmingham does take that L this week, they'll be motivated to go ahead and get the W because they'll want to keep that number one seed chance at home field for the playoffs alive. Uh, and again, you know, we talk about what do these teams play for as you get down to the situation. We got to remember, like, this isn't the National Football League, right? This is the UFL. So these guys are fighting for really their football careers. It's not, yes, you want to win the championship here, but especially the guys on, on who's already been eliminated on teams that have been eliminated, you're basically, this is your audition tape, right? Whether it's for the NFL, you know, uh, the CFL, the the ufl next year right you are essentially fighting for your football life so i don't expect like teams and players to just lay down you know it's not like they have any guarantees for next season like the main goal of everyone playing in this league is to make it to the nfl so it doesn't matter you know you a guy like ruben foster right his team sucks but you know the scouts aren't looking at the whole team right especially for a guy like a linebacker right if you can put some good tape and you can show that you're still an elite player and that you deserve a shot at the NFL, that's what they're fighting for. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of guys lay down or anything like that because of just the nature of this league. So I want to say that up front as we kind of break down and handicap this game because I understand, like, you know, some of these games is going to be like, what are these teams exactly playing for? So you got the playoff scenarios, and then you also have the reality of they're still – fighting to get to the nfl that is the main objective the main goal so i think these guys are going to fight hard and i think you know we're not going to see crazy swings whether it's personnel or lack of effort and things like that all right let's get started so we are going ahead and we are kicking it off with the first game on the slate here so this is going to be saturday at 12 eastern time we got the st louis battle hawks taking on the arlington renegades your St. Louis Battlehawks there coming in at six and two. Arlington with just one win on the season. Um, so it's, you know, I think this is going to be a, a pretty good matchup because this, let's look at the spread here. So you got your uh, Arlington is catching three points at home as a home dog there over under 46. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the injuries, then we'll kind of go into a little bit more of the breakdown like I like to do. So looking at the depth charts here, biggest takeaways is quarterback position for the Battle Hawks. Manny Wilkins, it looks like he's going to get the start. AJ McCarron was practicing this week in a limited fashion. He has a left ankle injury that he injured against Birmingham, uh, where he <laughs> famously, uh, if you can say that about this league, but famously kind of said that he thought his foot was broken or his ankle was broken. Uh, that is definitely not the case. If his ankle was broken, he would have no shot at playing this week. The fact that he's able to be limited in practice tells me it's probably just an ankle sprain, not as not as serious as he originally thought. But Wilkins, last week he looked pretty good, um, so I think he's going to be a capable backup. And then as far as the other guys that they're missing, starting guard uh, Vidal, Vidal Alexander and cornerback Levert Hill, um, are both going to be out, but they do get back wide receivers, Marcel Aitman and Jacor Pearson. So they're, they are going to have their full complement of skill guys. And I really think it's, it's kind of by far the best wide receiver group. And you can really throw the running backs there. I think they got the best skill players, uh, out of anyone in the league. So when they're fully healthy, watch out, um, on the over on the Arlington side of the ball, uh, a couple guys out, you know, Jalen Redmond's been out this really most of the year and he's a stud, but. You know, they've been figuring things out without him. So that's not completely new, even though he did practice this week for the first time in several weeks. 
Starting quarterback Evans is out, and uh, backup running back Lady Brown is also out. So fairly healthy, you know, backup running back. Brown's been out. Uh, Redmond's been out. Evans is really the only guy that's kind of popped up here. But uh, otherwise, they're pretty healthy. Um, so the way that I'm targeting this game, right? So it's, it's a situation where Arlington, despite only having one win, they've been in every game. We saw this game in St. Louis. Arlington put up a hell of a flight, a fight back when I thought they still had a chance to actually be a decent team. Uh, that game in week two was St. Louis won by a field goal to knock to walk it off. Uh, Arlington actually missed the field goal, trying to you know get a game, would have been a game potentially a game winning field goal. They missed, and then sorry, St. Louis went down and they kicked the field goal to end it. So they won twenty seven to. 24. So it was a close, close, uh, tightly contested game, and both offenses really kind of had some success. And, you know, I'm calling for something a little bit similar here in this one. Uh, so really what the play that I'm targeting the most is the over 46 in this one. Uh, I, I think that, look, St. Louis is the second highest scoring offense. Uh, they were very run heavy with Wilkins uh, in, in the backfield there. I know they were missing Jacor Peterson and Marcel Aitman. He did hit Butler, Hakeem Butler, a couple times. Um, but he's he's pretty – his legs are definitely – looks like his best weapon, at least at this point. And then you have Wayne Gallman and Jacob Sailors in the backfield, uh, two very capable running backs. So I do like – you know, if they do run that uh, heavy offensive approach – that's not very good for this Arlington defense. I mean, they're really bad against both the run and the pass, but they're a bad defense overall. They can get gouged on the ground. They're a pretty undisciplined group. Um, so even though they were playing a little bit better recently, uh, they're still you know one of the worst defenses in the league. They give up a ton of points. So I like St. Louis to have success. And you know, as good as St. Louis is on defense, where they're a pretty balanced team and they're really good against the pass. I, you know, Luis Perez, as bad as this team has been, he's the passing yards leader for a reason. He's been able to really just kind of have his way with most secondaries. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and trust that the Arlington Arlington offense is going to be able to put up points. Really, I think both offenses are going to put up points. I think we're going to see another, you know, 27-24 game. Uh, you know, that would get us there. Even, you know, to uh, something like 25-23, you know, we see some crazy scores in the UFL, obviously, with those extra points. But I just think both these teams get at least into the 20s, and it pushes us over that 46 number. Um, you know, if I had to pick a side, I would take St. Louis. I, I would really honestly take them on the money line, the minus 175 again. With this no extra points and the kind of wacky scoring system, we see teams win by one and two a lot more often in the NFL. And I think this game is going to be close. So, you know, I'm not – I don't really – Love aside, I think St. Louis is the better team. Arlington, let's face it, they just find ways to lose. They just beat a really, really, really bad Memphis team. Uh, that's really the only win they've been able to etch out. They've been able to keep it close, though. They've been able to score. They don't really get blown out. So that's why I like the over 46 in that game the most. All right, moving on there. We're going to the next game on the slate, and that is the uh, USFL two-time defending champions, uh, and looks like they're going to, you know, well on their way to a UFL championship. Birmingham Stallions at 8-0, uh, and o, taking on the Saint San Antonio Brahmas at 6-2. and two. Uh, Let's see if the Brahmas have anything to say about that undefeated record here. So uh, let's, let's, uh, Bur it's in San Antonio. So San Antonio's at home in the Alamo Dome. Shout out to the San Antonio Alamo Dome home in my first UFL game there. Uh, they, um, that, that place, I will say that place probably got a, you know, San Antonio, Birmingham, St. Louis, Michigan, really the places you're going to see really, <laughs> uh, coincidentally, the four playoff teams are really the ones you'll see some type of a home field advantage. So, uh, it's in San Antonio there and looking at the, or San Antonio is catching eight and a half at home. So it's San Antonio plus eight and a half is the line over and under, uh, 44 points. So go ahead and peek over at that Jep chart. So we do have the Saturday Jep charts. Unfortunately, even though I'm recording this on a Friday, uh, the the Saturday, Sunday Jep charts have not been released. Uh, they'll probably be released sometime today. Again, it you know they're still trying to figure all that stuff out. But over on the Birmingham side of the ball, uh, really they're pretty healthy. But their secondary JoJo Tillery, who they cut and then brought back, who is a pretty solid player. I'm not really sure why they cut him. Um, and then court, starting quarterback Mark Gilbert. So two starters in the back end uh, will not be out there for Saturday's game. I think that's relevant. Um, you know, I think Quentin Dormady has the ability to 
stretch the ball downfield to really, you know, throws a, a pretty good deep ball when, when he's got time. So I think that's pretty important. You know, that, that Birmingham defense is a really good defense, but they've been beat up lately. You know, uh, they, they got these guys out. Obviously you had um, shark dog kind of medically retiring there. So, uh, you know, this, as good as the defense is, they, there is some holes there due to some injuries. And then on the San Antonio side, they're pretty healthy as well. Uh, outside linebacker, Tim Ward, who's kind of a rotational guy. They really rotate like six or seven guys on that uh, four man front in the defensive line. That's really what makes them really good. But the other pass rushers are good to go. And then um, John Lovett, you know, one of the leading rushers and uh, really leading point scorers in the league. He's going to be out. That's big. However, I don't think it's as big as it could be because we now have Anthony McFarland back and Anthony McFarland looked really good last week. Uh, you know, he had over a hundred yards. He had a touchdown. He had some long, long, really explosive plays. So I, I, you know, and our, Anthony McFarland was the starter above John Lovett to begin the year. So let's not forget that he, you know, he is a good player. So really we're talking about the RB two who I know looked good and took over when McFarland was injured. So, you know, you got, basically a couple backups that are going to be out for San Antonio. So, you know, I think San Antonio has the health edge and I, you know, this is kind of tip in my hand, but this is where I think I'm going to go here. Uh, my best bet for this game is going to be San Antonio Brahma's plus eight and a half. I just think eight and a half is entirely too many points. You know, these are both playoff teams. These are both balanced teams. Uh, you have San Antonio has the best scoring defense and they've been as healthy as they've been. I know um, Tim Ward is going to be out. But they've got Delonte Scott back. They've got uh, Bryce Thompson back. Their entire secondary is healthy. Uh, you know, they've been pretty banged up these past few weeks, and they've still been able to, you know, put it together. So I'm, I'm really excited to see them go up against Birmingham, who is the best offense. They are the best offense in every category. Um, you know, they've got a really good defense. They've got a really good rush defense. But again, you know, they've already not – not that they're bad in the secondary, but they're missing two starters. And it's not like, you know, they're, they're not, a, their past defense is the more susceptible side. Right. So um, I think that San Antonio is going to be able to have some success with their balanced offense. Uh, they, you know, are no slouch on offenses either. They're the third best offense uh, and they're pretty balanced as well. So yes, I understand that, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm calling for San Antonio to straight out win this game. I think they do have home field advantage. I think that, you know, Birmingham has played some close games and they've been on the ropes at times, right? St. Louis really, you know, was going tit for tat for them until, um, until AJ McCarron went down. You know, if, I think if AJ McCarron doesn't get hurt, I think there's a really good chance that St. Louis pulls off that win. And I was in Birmingham. Uh, I think with San Antonio being at home, I, first of all, I just eight and a half is way too many points, but now, you know, I've, I'm, I'm going to also sprinkle the money line. It's a nice juicy plus three forty. Again, it's plus three forty for a reason. I mean, Birmingham hasn't lost in, seems like forever, right? So I get that. But I do think with San Antonio's defense, their pass rush, their ability to take the ball away, I think that could cause problems for Birmingham. So I like them to keep it close on the plus eight and a half. Well, I love them to keep it close, but I, I do honestly think that this is a chance where San Antonio, you know, Birmingham just has to win one of these last two games. If San Antonio wants home field in the playoffs, they got to win both these games. So I think San Antonio is going to be a little bit more motivated, a little bit more ready to get after this. And uh, yeah, give me the Brahmas plus eight and a half and sprinkle that money line a little bit at that nice plus 340. All right, folks, we're moving on over to Sunday. But before we do, we're halfway through. So you know what that means? I got to tell you about all the great things we're doing over here at IDP+. Plus. First off, Fantasy Football Expo. Listen, if you're a United Football League fan, then you're a thousand percent an NFL fan, and you probably are a fantasy football fanatic like the rest of us here at IDP+. Plus. So you're probably already got uh, August 10th or that weekend circled uh, for the Fantasy Football Expo. But hey, if you needed another reason to come out, I'm going to give you one right now. Uh, come join us Saturday, August 10th at the Brew Kettle next to the Pro Football Hall of Fame for a drafting extravaganza. And for the first time ever, IDP Plus is hosting an IDP League. So be a part of history and join us there on August the 10th. We'll have uh, you know that in the show notes, a little bit more of that description. Another thing I want to tell you about is our friends over at Trophy Smack. So it's draft season. We are, are now 104 days away from the NFL season. You know, it, it is that point to where we can really start focusing on the National Football League and, you know, exactly what what where it all started, the, the kind of the mecca, right, where these UFL guys are trying to get. 
Uh, but you want to get ahead of the game right now with Trophy Smacks. Gorgeous draft boards complete with pay player stickers so deep you couldn't possibly need them all. And for the first time, Trophy Smack has an IDP expansion pack. That's right. They're letting us people that care about defense, that care about real football, both sides of the ball, we finally get to come to the table and play. So go ahead and check that out. Again, we'll be in the show notes. And then the last thing I want to tell you about really quickly is our friends over at Expedia. Listen, it is hot. I know I was just in Texas. It was like 95 degrees. It's getting hot. Summer's right around the corner. It's time for you to take out the spouse, take out the wife, the husband, take the kids out, go on vacation, right? You deserve it. You've been working hard. Hopefully, you know, you we hit some of these picks and we can pay for this vacation. But everybody loves to go on vacation. Nobody likes to plan for it. You know, we want to get the best deal, but who wants to sit there with 20 tabs and you're clicking over left and right and, you know, you got to call this place and see if they do this and blah, blah, blah. Just go to Mixpedia. It's your one-stop shop for everything travel. So we're thrilled to announce our partnership with them. Um, you know, the way it works is they're an affiliate partner. So we have our special link that we're going to link down below. So since you're a fan of us, we are going to give you those special discounts. They're going to have special sales and discounts just for you folks. So go ahead and help us out by heading over to Expedia. All right, we are back. We got two more games to wrap up week nine, and then uh, we're going to get out of here and enjoy this fun Friday here. Ah, so let's go ahead and we are on to, yep. So now Sunday on the Sunday slate. Oh, ex, yep. Is that, huh? Realizing that some of, some of these pictures loaded, some of these pictures did not. So I apologize. Let me pull up. We're actually going to talk about the DC. Jeez, where are they at? There it is. All right. So we're going to talk about the DC and Memphis game first here. So Sunday, you got two games. They're both at 2.30 Eastern time. I <laughs> no idea why the UFL decided to schedule both their games at the same exact time on Sunday. I guess maybe so we can feel like we're watching the NFL. You can flip over and, and not, you know, maybe you dual screen it. Hey, you know, why not? Uh, but uh, yeah, couldn't tell you exactly why they decided to, to do both as a double header, new league, trying stuff out, whatever. So you got the DC defenders taking on the Memphis showboats. Memphis is catching five at home as a home dog. And uh, the over under is 45 and a half. So, you know, we got two teams knocked out of the playoffs. Again, just talked about these guys are fighting for their football lives. I expect them to play hard. I expect, you know, not to be a huge drop off or anything crazy. Obviously, I'd love to have the depth charts because that would tell me exactly to make sure like, you know, they don't sit Jordan Tayamu to give somebody else some tape or anything like that. You know, that'd be definitely nice to know. Uh, so definitely something you want to monitor. I'll be putting that out on my ex uh, over at the DGen doc. So, you know, make sure you stay up to date there. But we're going to assume that everything is kind of it's going status quo. So uh, we're going to look at the depth charts really quick. Uh, so you're on the DC side, or excuse me, the practice reports. So this is all we have at this point. Again, as of Friday at around 3.30, 3 or 4 p.m. Eastern time, I would expect these to be out later tonight. Um, so definitely check those. But we're going to go off the practice reports here. For the uh, DC side of the ball, pretty healthy. Uh, but they've got their secondary is a little bit beat up there. Um, so it looks like starting cornerback Michael Joseph may be out with a calf injury. He hasn't practiced yet this week, so I would expect him to be out. And then Santos Ramirez, he's got a concussion. The fact that he was able to get a limited practice is a good sign. You would hope that he would be able to get a full practice today on Friday. And if he is able to get a full practice, then he does have a good shot to play. However, with that limited, you just don't know. So he's really kind of questionable at this point. So you got potentially two starters in the back end being out for D.C., uh, over on the Memphis side, <laughs> their long CBS receipt looking uh, injury report, it's not as bad as it looks. Um, they're taking the Patriots, the New England Patriots way, at least under Belichick, where they just like list anybody who's got like a a, <laughs> a little boo boo. Anybody with a band aid on gets on the injury report, uh, and you know, just a way to kind of throw teams off. But as you can tell, a lot of these guys are practicing in full at this point as of Thursday. Um, the really the biggest concerns that I see is that uh, both quarterbacks, Cakes, Cookus, and Troy Williams are still limited. Um, you know, Cookus did play last week and got the start and was able to play through. So, you know, you'd expect him to be able to go. And then Troy Williams, you know, and getting two limited practices fingers. Uh, I would kind of expect both guys to be available. It's going to be interesting to see who starts. I personally think Case Cookus is a way get better quarterback. I just think this Memphis team is, is god awful. 
I just think they're they're just bad. That offensive line is is literally, you know, I think you could legitimately put some traffic cones out and probably get more blocks than you're going to get it with this offensive line. Um, so you got your quarterbacks a little bit banged up and probably scared for their life anytime they they get the ball back there. Uh, but other than that, everyone else, you know, of relevance, I'll say, everyone else who's made an impact so far in the season uh, is practicing in at least in a limited faction. And you got your wide receivers there. Um, you know, all kind of fully practicing. So it, despite, you know, people being banged up and this and that, I think it's, it's when we get the depth charts, it's going to look a lot better than what it looks like right now. All right, breaking down the game. Um, so we've got, again, two teams out of the playoffs. However, I do expect them to still fight hard. Um, Memphis, on the Memphis side of the ball, yeah, they're the worst defense in the league. Like, they're really bad, right? Uh, especially their passing defense is is not good not good uh they let up the most yards or the most points in the league uh on offense doesn't get any better worst offense especially running the ball running the ball they are terrible darius victor is a capable running back he's a good running back he when he was a new jersey general he was he gained the nickname of a bowling ball because he will run the first or two or three guys over it's just their line is so bad he's got five guys in the backfield like every play on the D.C. side, it's a little bit better, not much. They're the second-worst defense, especially on the ground. They're really bad on the, against, against the run. However, like I just said, Memphis can't run the ball to save their life, right? It, it's just really a recipe for disaster. Their offensive line it can't protect the quarterback, and they can't open up any holes. So they've got to drop back and pass to have any shot. Uh, cause they've got some decent wide receivers actually. And, and Sage Sherrod at tight end, like they've got some decent playmakers and even, you know, the running backs are decent. They're pretty good. They just, their offensive line is awful. So, you know, as bad as DC can be against the run, I just don't think it comes to fruition because there's going to be no holes. Like, right. I mean, yeah. So they're, you know, DC, not that great against, uh, the run. Um, <laughs> they're not really good against the pass either, but, they also have a bad offense. So this is really statistically like two of the worst teams in the league going against each other, right? I'm going to take DC minus five. I know it's a decent amount, but Memphis is just to me that bad. Memphis at this point is an absolute train wreck. Like they are the team that will hurt themselves repeatedly, whether it's turnovers or negative plays. They just can't put it all together, right? I know week one was their only win against Houston, who is also really bad. Um, and right now, Houston, I think, is playing better than Memphis. I think if you rematch that game, I think Houston wins that game. Um, but, man, yeah, Memphis is just – i they're just – I can't bet on them. I just physically cannot bet on them. DC's look competent the past couple weeks. Um, you know, last week they, they really gave uh, St. Louis kind of all they could ask for, and that was at St. Louis. Uh, when you go to Memphis, you are not going to have the same home field advantage as you have at St. Louis. So – I, I think DC, despite also being out of the playoffs, I think they're just a better team. So give me DC minus five there. I don't love uh, either side on the total. Um, it, you just got two bad teams. You just, you mean, it's, it's really tough to, to see how it could go. You know, I, I expect DC to be able to score, but Memphis could put up anywhere between. I mean, really for me, it, it, I could see them scoring three points. I could see them scoring 20 points and also letting up like 50, you know? So I just, I'm, I'm staying away from the total there on that one. All right, folks, last game on the slate, and we have, there it is, Michigan Panthers versus your Houston Roughnecks at Houston Drill, baby drill. All right, so uh, you got Michigan coming in uh, at 6-2, and two, I believe. I believe 6-2, and two. yeah. And then Houston uh, just has that one win against Arlington, so 1-7. and seven. Um, Yeah, not great. Houston's catching four at home. Only four, and the over under is forty. Uh, we this is another game where we've seen this game before uh, in in the Michigan uh, Ford Field there at Michigan. Michigan beat them by 14, 34 to twenty. It really wasn't even that close. Uh, Michigan really could score at will, which Michigan's a good team, but you know you got to be pretty bad to let the Michigan Panthers just run up and down on you. Um, and yeah, Houston, yeah, really just kind of got beat in every way. So let's check out the injury reports here. Uh, we'll start with Houston because it's just really one guy of relevance. It's starting quarterback Garrett, Jared, 
Garitano, who obviously missed the majority of the year and then came back and uh, he's picked up a wrist injury. So he hasn't practiced yet this week. So it's probably unlikely he goes. I believe uh, coach um, CJ Harris uh, said that, or Charles Johnson, excuse me. Uh, is it Charles Harris? CJ Johnson. Yes, CJ Johnson. That's what it should be. Um, but anyway, he uh, said that Nolan Henderson, so kind of QB3, was supposed to get the start to give him some tape. So, um, yeah, he's they brought him in really only to be a running quarterback. Uh, Michigan is really good against the run, so I don't like that for that situation. I mean, it's hard to, yeah. But anyway, so Garantano is unlikely to play. And then on Michigan side, you know, it looks pretty bad. Um, however, my one caution would be that, well, all right. So one guy we know is definitely going to be out is starting running back West Hills, who's been one of the bright spots on this team. He's out for the season. Unfortunately, he's on IR. So he's going to be done for not only now, but the playoffs. It is a bit of a blow. However, Matt Colburn, they're running back number two. They're really one A, one B. He has been, he's kind of been on a tear and he's shown when he was with the Philadelphia stars, he could be a capable running back both in the pass and the rush game. So this is a bit of a blow. I do, you know, West Hills is definitely the bigger back. He's definitely kind of delivered a little bit of that boom, but Colburn is a capable back. So I don't think this kills them, especially in this game against a bad Houston team. They also have five starters, not practicing at this point. Uh, most teams, I would say this is like a glaring problem, but the Michigan Panthers have been notorious, especially wide receiver Marcus Sims. He doesn't practice like at all. He won't practice all week and he'll magically be a full go for the game. So, you know, they've got four guys on the defensive side of the ball that are, are starters. All of those guys listed are starters who are not practicing. But again, just like Marcus Sims, I'm not going to be surprised when they somehow magically play. So I'm not going to overreact and think that, you know, Michigan's going to be down half their defense. Uh, you also got quarterback uh, two to start the year and now starter um, Danny Etling, who took over for EJ Perry. It looks like he's back. And then you have uh, uh, Kai Nakua, stud safety, probably one of the best players in the league. Not probably one of the best players in the league is also back as well. So no Frank Ginda. He's done for the year. Um, you know, they, you definitely want to have Breland Spreaks out there, one of the sack leaders in the UFL. But um, – I'm give me Michigan, Michigan minus four. Uh, we we saw this game before. I know there's some some moving pieces, but Michigan's a good Michigan's a balanced, solid team. They're good against the run. Um, you know, I think if Houston, if they could get Mark Thompson going, they just hate to give him the ball for whatever. I don't I don't get it. Whatever reason, their best player on their team by far, just they refuse to give him the ball on Mark Thompson. Um, and Nolan Henderson, you know, if he's going to be come in and, and really try to, to establish himself on the ground, like that plays right into what Michigan is good at. I don't think he's going to be able to pull to tear them apart through the air. And I frankly, other than Justin Hall, I don't think they have the wide receivers to do that. So I think we're getting a little bit lucky with a short number here. Um, you know, well, I don't know if it's Houston at home. I don't know, you know, what, if Vegas just thinks that Michigan is just too beat up. Um, but I think we're getting, we can take advantage of this. I, you know, Michigan, again, they won by 14 last time. They're the clearly better team. They've still got some things to play for as far as whether, you know, Birmingham wins or loses, they know they're playing the best team in the league in Birmingham. So they need to, you know, they need to go in with momentum to drop a game to Houston. is just not how you want to go into the playoffs. So give me Michigan minus four. All right, folks, that is all four games. So we'll do a quick recap here. So we've got St. Louis Arlington. Give me the over 46 in that game. And then if either side, just give me St. Louis money line at the minus 175. I will pay the juice there to avoid, uh, you know, getting hooked by some of these weird scores. Probably my best bet on the slate so far or that I love at this point is the Brahmas plus eight and a half. I just think that's way too much. I understand Birmingham is a good team. Not saying they're not at all, but so is San Antonio, man. San Antonio is a good team. They're going to have the home field. And then, you know, I think they, they, at Alamo Dome, I saw it firsthand, man. It can get electric. I think, you know, you're, you're basically looking at a potential UFL championship um, a preview. Right. So I, I think that the fans are going to get jacked up for that. So I think they're going to play hard. Uh, you got that defense as healthy as they've been. And you got Anthony McFarlane back. 
You've got two guys out in that secondary for Birmingham. I think Dormandy can take advantage. Also, I didn't mention Chase Garbers, the QB1 originally. He's on the depth chart. He's active this week. So if Dormandy's not taking advantage, you got a very capable guy you can slot in there and get the offense going. So I do uh, really like San Antonio this week. Sprinkle a little bit on that money line at plus 340. Uh, D.C. at Sunday games, give me the favorites. Give me D.C. minus five. Give me Michigan minus four. This is really just a fade of Memphis and Houston. Um, you know, if there's any two teams that you told me are we're just going to quit on the season and just continually hurt themselves, it's Memphis and Houston. So what they've been doing all year, you know, they've, they've both gotten blown out before. They've both – really, you know, looked like they could be competent for a second and then they just blow it in the next half or the quarter or whatever it may be. They just can't finish games to save their lives. Give me DC and Michigan to go ahead and get it done there as the favorites. And last thing before we wrap up, I always like to give out an underdog play of the day over on underdog fantasy. Um, however, I'd love to do it right now, but typically the lines don't come out until – Friday late afternoon, like around 4 p.m. ish is usually what I've noticed, 4 to 6 p.m., somewhere in that time range where they where they release them. Um, so, yeah, come join me. This was one I hit, uh, I think, two weeks ago or so. Uh, nice little 6X cash there. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and follow me on X at the DGen Doc, and I will be putting that out probably tomorrow. Uh, so I can have a little bit of time to look at these lines. Again, they should be released tonight. That's also you. I'll make sure I put out the uh, depth charts for the Sunday game. So we make sure we have a clear picture of who's actually going to be playing, right? Uh, especially on that Michigan side. I just want to make sure that some of those starters are actually going to play, um, you know, because they have some guys that have not been practicing, but that's kind of in their MO. Their injury report looks really ugly, and somehow they're magically all good to go on, you know, game day. So, all right, folks. It's been a pleasure to be back live with you uh, here at the UFL. I say live, but, you know, back being able to give break down these UFL games. Two weeks left in the regular season. I will just say one more time, if you're interested in, you know, I was able to write some articles. I wrote one about my San Antonio experience as far as, like, the Brahmas game when they played Michigan Panthers. Dormany's first game, he was the hometown kid. Uh, so if you, you're interested in kind of seeing what it's like to go to a UFL game, you're on the fence about that. Check that article out on the UFL.com. And then uh, the new article is going to be released where I interviewed the head of player performance for the UFL, Mr. Sean Hayes, Coach Hayes, former Harvard linebacker, now turned strength and conditioning coach. He uh, had some time with, in the NFL with Houston Texans. He was over at the WWE for their developmental league, and now he's here at the UFL kind of running the ship. So I got to talk to him for about an hour, and I was able to write up kind of give you a behind the scene looks at you know the UFL, we all know the product on the field, the players on the field, but how do they get to game day, right? How do they get from, hey, maybe they have an injury during the week, or how do I get from the preseason where I need to work on, you know, maybe it's my my jump ability, maybe it's my uh, hamstring strength, maybe some imbalances here and there. So a little bit behind the rehab and training and behind the scenes of this new exciting league, able to send that out. Uh, that should be dropping uh, soon, if not this weekend, next week. So uh, definitely encourage y'all to check that out. And other than that, folks, let's have a hell of a weekend. Uh, we've only got a couple weeks left. Look, we got, what is it, four weeks of the UFL, and then we've got a decent lull into the NFL. So let's enjoy it. Go football, go IDP+, and let's win some money, baby. Doc is out of here. <laughs>